Thanks, Doug, and thanks to everybody for coming so, uh, so early this morning. Uh, I'm going to give a, a, a couple of case studies, not just one, if that's okay. And I've been set up beautifully by, uh, by both Kathy and Frank, so I think I can skip over some of the things, one of which is the enormous complexity of the flavonoids in food. And we're going to concentrate on just the ones in food and not the whole gamush, which amounts to five, seven, ten thousand compounds in all. Uh, the question before us is basically, is flavonoid science adequate to make consumption recommendations? And that's what I'd like to sort of uh, talk about in the next few minutes. Um, I think the bottom line is that it's really not quite yet ready, but we can certainly, as uh, nutrition and food scientists and epidemiologists and all the others in the audience, help fill some of these gaps. So how do we do this? Well, the first thing we always have to do is to strengthen the science by showing safety and in intended uses. And uh, this is, a, in, a, in a sense, a little problem because the safety and efficacy of both foods and dietary supplements are going to vary in terms of the doses that we eat, the content uh, that's there, the matrices, and also the context in which they are eaten or taken. Let me just illustrate that with uh, this slide, that the foods over on your uh, left have many different flavonoids, as Frank has shown so nicely, and a whole bunch of other constituents. And the supplements tend to have fewer constituents and potentially have, could be at much, much higher doses. Just to take cocoa uh, as an example, and uh, those who are cocoa experts need to correct me if I'm wrong here, but the values that I took from labels and from the, um, the databases were that two teaspoons of cocoa powder have about 50 milligrams of cocoa flavanols, a dark chocolate candy bar uh, of 42 grams, which is uh, probably less than m many of us would like to eat, is about 170 milligrams. And then if we had a, a stick, a, a, a supplement, we'd be up around 250 uh, milligrams. And you see there are big differences but from 10 calories to 200 calories to about 30 calories for the supplement. So just uh, one illustration there. If we look at tea beverages, uh, they certainly differ widely uh, from extracts. And we have to think of this uh, as well when we're talking about safety. And if you look there at all the different kinds of bioactives other than um, nutrients themselves that are in tea, it's a very complex mixture. And we could look at the catechins or the caffeine or the theanine, whatever. Um, what about green tea extract? Well, trying to find uh, a green tea extract, here's one. It was labeled as 80% polyphenols, about 50% catechin, mostly EGCG or GC, I always get mixed up on that, that would be equal in some ways, perhaps, to five cups of tea in terms of the catechins in one pill. So you see that the differences are quite large there, and we have to think of them when we're looking at safety as well as efficacy. So first thing is safety. Second thing is efficacy. What do we do in terms of demonstrating consistently some of the effects that Frank has done so nicely in summarizing. And the problem here, uh, first of all, of course, is that the health benefits vary, as Dr. Hu has pointed out. The cocoa flavonoids uh, may affect flow-mediated dilation and a whole bunch of other cardiovascular-related outcomes. The T catechins, the flavin 3 oils, there may decrease type 2 diabetes and stroke. The soy isoflavones, uh, may decrease uh, serum LDL cholesterol, and then other outcomes are being studied with uh, cranberry and grape proanthocyanins on urinary tract health, and the citrus, uh, uh, grapefruit, orange flavonoids, and some uh, are, seem to be related perhaps to some of the cancers. So the health benefits that you're looking at, you have to decide what you're going to look at. 
Um, so which, then the problem is which of those flavonoids have beneficial effects? You note in one of those meta-analyses, some of the studies were of total flavonoids and some were only of a couple of flavonoids. So that, I think, is a problem with some meta-analyses. But basically, it could be total polyphenolics or it could be total flavonoids, all those six monomeric plus the uh, oligomeric uh, class. Uh, it could be subclasses, for instance, the flavanthriols or isoflavonoids. It could be a flavonoid acting singly or with some other compounds, for instance, that might be true in some of the isoflavonoids. Or it could be a specific flavonoid con a compound. So it's, again, we have to make some decisions there when we're doing our science. Now, many classes have effects in the epidemiological studies, as we've seen, and they seem to vary depending on the outcome that is being measured. So that's one problem. Uh, another problem that Dr. Elwood elucidated so very well was that benefits are often based on surrogate markers of effect rather than simply on actual health outcomes, and you can understand that because our lifetimes are finite, and to try to study mortality, uh, we're up against uh, uh, the clock. Uh, so the endpoints, again, uh, differ, and here's just one example from Vogel of uh, one endpoint. Kathy mentioned some of the, uh, the, the risk uh, biomarkers were not uh, necessarily uh, definitive yet, and Endothelial dysfunction might be one that one could consider. We know uh, that it does have some effects that look like they're risky, uh, but it's still not clear as to whether the ultimate over there of coronary artery disease is uh, in that causal pathway. So here's just one example uh, down here of a flow-mediated dilation, and here is normal flow conditions, and then over here, is uh, with increased uh, flow conditions, you don't get much response. But I'll show you in a minute, coming back uh, to uh, a function that's uh, more uh, normal, that there may be some changes there. So some of these surrogate markers that Kathy mentioned uh, of cardiovascular risk that are not approved right now uh, in the United States, but many people are studying them, First are arterial measures such as endothelial dis uh, function and flow-mediated dilation. You could also look at things like pl platelet aggregation, and I know some of you in the audience are looking at many, many other markers as well, but let's just take them for the purpose of this uh, discussion. Kathy also mentioned uh, one study, but I think, I think FDA funded actually two studies, or somebody funded them. Was it FDA? Okay. Uh, the Institute of Medicine at the National Academy did two reports on biomarkers, and here they are. They're well worth reading, um, and uh, they sort of set the standards for what's going on in this field, at least uh, in terms of thinking. Here's another problem that Kathy mentioned, and that is that the biomarkers of risk or effect must reflect disease endpoints, but some don't. For example, you have an ingredient, could be a flavonoid here, uh, the surrogate marker of effect there. Uh, but to really validate it, you have to make sure that the surrogate marker uh, is associated with the disease endpoint. And if you've never read a wonderful paper Art Shatskin wrote about 10 years ago on all of this, it's really a classic now and I think uh, is well still worth reading. So that's uh, one, another problem. And then there's the problem of, the big problem, the elephant in the room. Why is it that evidence of flavonoid effects is so mixed? Even in the slides we've seen this morning, it's pretty mixed. One possibility is that there just aren't any effects there, and that the effects are due to poor diets in general that are also poor in flavonoids. And that's not an impossibility. It could just be that. A second possibility, I think, is that there are only specific compounds or, or, or classes that are effective, and, and so 
they've gotten all mixed up. Some people say total flavonoids is two classes, some say it's seven. And there are very few studies, actually, that measure all seven. So I think we need further study in terms of that, and we need to clean up some of our uh, analyses as well. But then there's the third category of things, and I'd like to talk the most about that, and that, that is that existing epidemiologic and clinical studies are insufficient. And we think that this is likely and correctable. And uh, my colleagues on the flavonoid committee uh, and many others of you in this room are trying to improve the science uh, for both of these types of studies. So that's where I'm going to go now. Um, the question is, is today, is there enough evidence for a flavonoid dietary reference intake? Now, we've also heard that DRIs like EARs and AIs are for nutrients, and a nutrient is a substance essential for growth and maintenance of life. And Kathy's mentioned, I think, that fiber is a nutrient, or fiber is in, it has a DRI, even though it's really not a 100% uh, certified nutrient, I guess. Uh, <laughs> The, the fiber people will disagree. Uh, well, what does setting an estimated average requirement require? And I, there are many people in this audience who know this much better than I do. But certainly we need a common mechanism of action, some constituents that are causing effects, functional indicators and markers, and then dose response of some be beneficial functional marker. And since flavonoids aren't nutrients, can they have a, a DRI? Well people come back and say, well, fiber has an AI and it's not a nutrient. So the thing is, here is the EAR and the AI out here uh, uh, for a healthy population. Well, uh, what about a total flavonoid EAR or AI? I think not quite yet. There's still some gaps. Uh, the plausible mechanism of action, there are mechanisms, maybe antioxidant, uh, but I'm not sure for all flavonoids that there's one common mechanism. Uh, method for setting an EAR, no, I don't think we're quite there yet. Intake measures of constituents, they're pretty crude, they're still pretty crude, and no real good biomarkers of all intake. Uh, convincing evidence of a consistent effect on functional indicators, don't think we're there yet either. So. The other problem is that it's unlikely to be the top priority for funders. There are a lot of competing people like the omega-3 people who are pushing to get uh, attention. What about an AI? If you can't get an EAR, what about an AI? Well, a plausible mechanism of action, yes, maybe. Uh, intake available, yes. Uh, constituents causing uh, effects that are known, possibly that's there. Uh, functional indicator, sh not sure that's the case. Dose response of constituents versus some functional indicator, probably not yet. The data on blood pressure, cholesterol, and morti mortality and morbidity, which are all acceptable endpoints, are mixed or unavailable. Uh, and other surrogate effect biomarkers like endothelial function probably are available, but at least regulatory authorities in this country don't recognize them as valid quite yet. So let's go on to a flavanol AI. Uh, plausible common mechanism of action? Yes, I think that there is. Uh, constituents causing effect? Yes. Uh, flavan 3 oles but I'm, I'm not sure about the intake biomarker. Maybe there is one, and someone in the audience can tell me that. Uh, functional indicator and marker? Yes flow-mediated dilation, and dose uh, of component versus response, yes, we can get that, but not for an approved biomarker. So there are some things that are positive, some are negatives. What about AIs for flavian 3 oles uh, Well, the first thing is, well, what are the T constituents that are causing the beneficial effects on cardiovascular disease? There are a whole bunch of things it could be. I think the evidence is probably pretty good that it's a flavian 3 ol I don't know if it's that particular one, but basically uh, it sounds like uh, the evidence is going in that direction. There are a lot of different catechins to choose from. 
but we'll hear more about that from maybe Doug or someone else on the panel. There are also a whole bunch of other bioactives in tea, though, and some of them are in that slide right there. So what about an AI for tea flavonoids? Well, there's a plausible mechanism of action, I think, uh, but the constituent causing effects, possibly. Uh, is there an intake biomarker? Not sure there is. Again, I may be corrected in the discussion. A functional indicator and marker? Not quite yet, but there is a, a, some marker. And then the dose component versus uh, response of some beneficial functional indicator? Probably not yet. Uh, most of the studies are observational. Well, let's go down to the notion of a structure function claim. Um, is there a food or constituent in food that's a beneficial health effect? Uh, well, if we looked at the Bradford Hill criteria, um, perhaps not yet. Uh, what about a reasonable quantity of food and pattern of consumption to get the claimed effect? I think that that's probably there. Uh, and uh, specific groups that seem to be affected, and then can you relate them to the larger population? Possibly, yes. Uh, and is uh, consumer confusion, could you avoid it uh, uh, by a claim such as this? Perhaps, yes. Well, so we need to strengthen the science to prove that these flavonoid benefits justify recommendations. What about biomarkers of healthy uh, function? I think, Kathy, you brought that up at the end of your talk. These are mechanisms that keep people healthy uh, that are at an earlier stage on the continuum than those causing disease. This is a concept that comes out of the European Union, and one that they've looked at a lot is uh, endothelial function, and we've talked about it already over here as a marker of uh, disease risk, uh, but there are also some positive things that it does. And, um, here again, looking at the same slide we looked at before, if you look at flow-mediated vasodilation in healthy endothelium, uh, it responds, and uh, uh, maybe there's, uh, maybe it's a marker of vascular health. Uh, EU guidance at present uh, for beneficial effects on heart health of food components is in the EFSA journal, the European Food Safety Authority journal, and it talks about beneficial physiological effects under Article 13 for endothelial function, reduced platelet aggregation, and I think there's one other uh, that they have looked at. It's not really risk reduction, it's really measures of health. And the question is whether there, it's possible to go this route. In Europe, it's my understanding that walnuts, tomato extract, and also cocoa flavon, well, those first two have already been approved. The third one, I gather, is still under uh, consideration by the European Union uh, Parliament, which, like our Congress, gets into the act as well, whenever it comes to food safety uh, and efficacy. Uh, so the problem is, is permissible speech in the U.S. Uh, the same? Well, no, it's different. Uh, these statements really are not quite the same as under our food law. They fall somewhere between structure function and content and general health advice, and they wouldn't be allowed in the United States. But they're worth sort of tossing about in the discussion. So they don't meet the standards yet for, uh, or the law uh, in the United States. So I think one thing we can do in this, uh, this group here today is to try to build the evidence for biomarkers of health and the ability to maintain flexibility in reacting to the environment. And I've given the examples of cardiovascular disease, but I'm sure there are a lot of others that we could also look at. We also need to strengthen and harmonize research to fill gaps, improve research uh, study reporting, do more hypothesis-driven research instead of data dredging. Characterize active ingredients and relate them to claimed effects. And all of these things are in the reporting requirements document that the, the colleagues on the flavonoid committee at ELSI and others have, have been working on. 
mounting stronger cohort studies, I think Frank said that, conducting intervention studies that use accepted as well as new effect biomarkers, using both together so we get some idea of how they relate to each other, using new techniques to better summarize existing data, pooling studies, meta-analyses, many others, Bayes analysis that we heard about yesterday, worrying about the double whammy that Kevin Dodd mentioned, uh, modeling the size of potential effects uh, from better nutrient databases and databases for flavonoids and better systematic reviews. So we need to show these effects uh, also by crafting messages that reflect the science. And dietary guidance type statements on flavonoids right now are things like eat more fruits more and more and more fruits and vegetables. Uh, now this fits nicely with my plate, existing dietary guidance on more fruits and vegetables and plant foods, and I think that's good. But it's not very specific, it's not very helpful, and it's not true in all cases because not all of those foods are high in flavonoids. So we need more specificity. What should we say? Is it eat more uh, fruits and vegetables, including those rich in flavonoids such as cocoa tea, soy, berries, citrus? I'm not sure that's the best way to communicate this, but I'll leave it to you. We need to show that those flavonoid benefits justify consumption re uh, recommendations. We certainly need more science on it, and we also need to craft better messages. Thank you.